iHeartRadio presents Podversations, a weekly discussion with the biggest names and influencers in podcasts. Hey everybody, and thank you for coming back and joining us. Thank you for taking a half hour to talk to us, and thank you for being a partner of iHeart. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm very glad to be here um, representing the British Isles <laughs> and the Queen. So for like, uh, you know, I didn't know that who you were representing. I'm going to change all my questions. <laughs> about the royal family um so for the f four or five minutes before we went live today we were talking about how you're in london we were talking about how you've been maybe lifelong is is too extreme way to put it but a long time surfer we were talking about how you're a neighbor of the the great and awesome bob Pittman, who's obviously the ceo of uh, of iheart um but I want to talk about, and all of that's great, that's for session number two, and you don't get to hear that yet. I want to talk about this thing that you've launched with us called um, called Mini Questions, which is like one of the most intelligently formatted podcasts I've seen in a long time. It's sort of loosely based on this idea of, of the Proust questionnaire, but you've definitely made it your own, of if I go to a lot of people that I think are really interesting. And you've definitely have sort of a who's who's list of interesting people from Tony Blair to Viola Davis to Chelsea Clinton. And I asked them all the same set of questions. It might get really interesting. So can you sort of talk me through, how did you come up with this format? Why these questions? And how has it surprised you as you've sort of rolled that out into the world and put it into practice? Well, you know, I'm I'm very nosy. That's the the you know the nascent point. And I come from from a very nosy family. You know, if you were my friend and you came up to my house when I was a kid, like it would be you know the, the third degree right off the bat. We ask a lot of questions, and there are a lot of games. And Proust's questionnaire was something that we'd sort of I knew about and. If you're interested in people and the idea, particularly as a kid, of being able to ask questions that reveal uh, something about an adult that you could then potentially, you know, hold over them, um, it seemed like a good thing to uh, to investigate. And when during this great pause that we've all just had, um, the idea how to be creative and how to expand and how to keep on expanding and being creative even when we were all in our homes. Um, the idea of doing a Redux version of, of Proust's questionnaire to really create, you know, it sounds a bit lofty and a bit pretentious, but to create a cultural anthology so that exactly that you can ask what Tony Blair's last meal would be and actually see how that meanders into, you know, I think I feel like on that particular one, or no, with Stephen Fry, the actor and writer, Stephen Fry, it started out about his his last meal and it went to the outer reaches of the universe and then came back around through creationism and the Bible and ended up back in, in you know, fish and chips. And it was bananas, just nuts. I was like, this is crazy. And, you know, Chelsea Handler, who I interviewed the other day, I was like, so Chelsea, you know, what, what would be your last meal? And she was like, spaghetti and clams. <laughs> <laughs> and I of love that. Course, and of course. The one, you know, the two word answer, or the three word answer is as valid. And, you know, people, people surprise you with how deep they go and with how shallow they want to be in different places. And that's, that's just human beings. And maybe there's something very human about asking the same questions because it does, it reveals what is different, but it really does show this commonality. Everybody wants to know what happens when we die. Yeah. Yeah. These are questions like, when and where were you happiest? I think it's seven questions. When and where were you happiest? What's the quality you like least about yourself? What would your last meal be? Um, what question would you most like answered? Like these are sort of, they range between um, throwaway, trivial, icebreaker, I'm not sure the right word, lighter questions and stumpers where you're like, whoa, I didn't see that one coming. Is there a question in particular that you've asked people that consistently surprises you maybe insofar as it stumps people where they're like, whoa, I got to take a second? You know, I think that and I asked it for this reason because I just I truly believe that it's the last question that I ask which is in your life can you tell me about something that has grown out of a disaster and 
you know, a lot of times people sort of begin by, you know, with Tony Blair. With Tony Blair, I was like, okay, well, here's your opportunity to explain Iraq. Here we are. I've just laid it all out for you. Carry on. And, you know, he actually said something along the lines of, um, well, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly. Disaster. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe not. Oh, can't really think of anything. Oh. And then he told this story about his parents died when he was very, very young. And he really, he was really raised by no one but his intellect and himself and then professors at, at Oxford or Cambridge. I can't remember where he went. Um, but he, and I, so I thought he wasn't going to answer it, but then he, he couldn't help it. He came back around to, and he brought it up himself of talking about Iraq and here we are 20 years on and you know, with the eyes that we have now and the perspective that we have now, he was like, I'm, I'm not sure I would have done the same thing. And I mean, that felt like, I felt like an unbelievable thing to hear a world leader say that like, there was great humility in it and there was regret. And there was also a sort of bellying up to the, to, to, to history and to not be revisionist about it, except in the way that, you know, you wish it could have not happened. It's incredible. It's a, it's a, no matter how he got there, it's kind of a moment of, of a lot of uh, vulnerability for definitely. For and hum, you know, he's, he's human. Yeah. God, I wouldn't want to be prime minister. I mean, I, the thought of it, 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 it cleaves you in the thought of that much pressure and for so many lives. And I don't actually know how he's still sort of completely compass mentors. I think most of them do go a bit mad. Let me ask you a couple of these questions. I mean, the simplest format of this would be just to throw throw the mini questions back on mini driver. But I am genuinely interested in a couple of these. Let's start with the one that you just said. That's that's sometimes the hardest maybe for for subjects that you talk to. And yeah. and what so how, how would you answer it? Tell me about something in your life that's grown out of uh, some kind of disaster. Well, I you know, all I ever wanted to be was an actor and a musician like that's I just wanted to do that from a very very early age and my whole life was centered around that it was heading for that um and I went to you know a really great conservatory drama school in London and I studied for four years and then at the end of that four years and the whole of my life leading to this moment I was the only kid to graduate in my class without getting an agent without having any representation you know I stood in the pub with my mom and our glasses of warm white wine and I was like what do I what do I do now and she was like I don't know drink your wine like get a job and I had no idea what to do because this there was this free fall moment and everything felt like it had just crashed and I didn't know what to do except you know I was what I was, I was 20 and um there was burgeoning house music and acid house had just it, it just sort of come out of Chicago and it had hit England and it was going crazy. And there were these huge dance parties. And because I didn't really do drugs, I didn't drink. Um, I was always the kid at you know, 7 a.m. who was just there with the car. And there was another girl who was didn't drink or do drugs. And we used to drive back home together and through the summer. We'd drive back home, we'd chat about this, that, the other, whatever. And then at the end of the summer, she was like, she said, well, what, you know, what do you do? I've never asked you what you do. And I was like, well, you know, I'm supposed to be an actress. So I'm just all terrible, gone terrible. She's like, oh my God, I work for a casting director. You should come in. And I was like, what, just come in? And she's like, yeah, she'd love you. And she worked for the, like, the biggest casting director in London. And when I went to see them, I have no idea. She's called Leo Davis. And I have no idea why she thought I was funny or desperate or both. But she made a call to an agent who I could hear down the phone going, no, no, we saw her. She was terrible in like some <laughs> wreck. It was awful. And she convinced them to take me on. And it really did. It changed my life changed in an in an instant. But it was from having let go and just I went dancing and I found the rest of my life. <laughs> wow. And and so the only other question I'll ask you from your question, your questionnaire, what what question would you most like answered? I, you don't have to understand. I ask these questions because I don't know the answers, and I'm constantly trying to find out what the hell is going on. I feel bad so, listening these back on you, Vic, but Tony I, Blair doesn't know what's what's up. 
you know, um, I'm going to bypass death because everybody, everybody says, I want to know what happens when we die. And I mean, I do want to know that, but, but I more want to know how do we, how do we consciously evolve here now in our lives to a place that can embrace and incorporate all these, all these things we keep seeing in each other and that we keep, we keep not choosing. So, and this was from Baratun de Thurston, it's not why, it's how, how do we, how do we, uh, how do we change? I want to know how do we change in order to create a world where all boats can rise with the tide and that it isn't an either or situation or a shoehorn situation or a performative anything situation, but it's genuine and it's how we, it's how we evolve. I would like to know that, please. It's interesting because I think a lot of the systems that we've put in place, not to get too big or or um, broad about it, but a lot of the systems that we swear are thousands of years old, educational systems, healthcare systems, technologies are minutes old, <laughs> maybe a hundred years old. And in a moment like quarantine, it does sort of pressure test some of that stuff and it makes your life, I think, in its best form, it makes you live it a little more intentionally. I have four kids. Are they virtual learners? Are they in-person learners? You at least are sort of questioning that again, and it makes you it makes you question systems that you you presumed were permanent. And and it's sort of that's how I understand what what you just said a little bit, which is like these are choices, and they don't feel like it sometimes. You feel like you're in the middle of a of a system, but we invented those systems. We invented this educational system, and now is the time to to fix it if we want to. But America is so what's so what's so difficult and interesting to try and understand is like it is amendment is literally written into the Constitution of America. So how come it is so difficult to amend these systems? Why can they not be dismantled and remade in a way where where more people benefit? That it just looks that way, that nobody has to lose out in order for someone else to benefit, but that rather we we create it like that. There's there's this, you know, you say like a lot of these systems are, are, are really young and it's like, yeah, good, great. Get rid of it. Let's yeah. do something. Let's do something yeah. else. Let's. Yeah. And there are so many extraordinarily creative brains in our world right now is it's hard. I wish I wish they would all just get together, <clears throat> you know, for like a weekend, maybe a week. Well, and you just figure it out. You, we quickly, I think, as humans assume that the stuff that's around us and technology is the, the greatest example of this was always there. It's yeah. hard actually to remember a world without iPhones. I can, of course, I can remember growing up and not having phones and social media and 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 even mobile phones, but in any capacity. But it's hard to remember that actually. As minutes go by, you adopt very quickly. But to make it much lighter for a second, quarantine. About a year and a half ago, maybe a year and two months ago, we all moved into a new world order. Everything changed all of a sudden. I can remember March 2020 where I went from one week to normal work, normal travel, to just lockdown. How has your life changed during quarantine? From from the most trivial to the most fundamental, like what are you watching? What are you streaming? What are you reading more or less of? What have you noticed? Oh my God, I, um, I became a runner in lockdown. I read this book, Born to Run, which um, blew my mind and made me donate my Nikes. And I started, sort of working my way down to running barefoot, which I'd never done before. And now I do that pretty much everywhere. Um, we, well, I had never, my boyfriend and I were just dating and he, you know, I was like a bit scared in the beginning because of all the run on loo roll and there not being any bread in the shop. So I was like, do you think you could come and stay for a few days in case they turn the water off? And so he, he just never left. So we, 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 I'm just like, now we're kind of married. It's just, it's, so that happened. That's and the creation of this, it was huge. The creation of this podcast, you know, I wrote a proposal for a book that I'm writing. Um, it it turned out to be the most, out of all of this, like this hum, this underlying threat that we all lived with every day that made us feel so unsafe. There was so much creativity, um, maybe because there was something to push against. 
And again, maybe it's why I like these linear questions, because I think that boundaries are good. Bound boundaries make you press up against them and, and force you, force you to figure it out. As opposed to just being a kind of big old free fall and everybody just, you know, yapping on and on. It's like, no, get very centered and very clear and cut away all the fat and just, you know, my lockdown was about going for the meat, Connell. You did the iambic <laughs> pentameter of quarantines. <laughs> and so you've done a bunch of stuff. You've, you've obviously been a huge, um, a huge film presence, huge musician, now podcasting. So you have some sort of renaissance woman background to you of, of having the experience of like, I'm going to guess here, but like this medium does that for me. This medium does that. And this medium does this for me. And these are good in their different ways at different things. Is, is First of all, is the reason that you moved to podcasting during the last year and a half because of quarantine? Were you getting pent up as a creator and being like, well, I've got to go somewhere? Was that how this landed? You know what? It was no, it, would, it had been boiling for a while. It, it really had. It was really like, I, you know, I don't want to do the thing that I've been doing before in the way that I've been doing it before. Something needs to change. Something needs to give. And I need outlets for for creativity. So I've been, it had definitely been on the boil. And then quarantine just forced the apps. The, they're like, OK, we'll, we'll then make the proposal for all these ideas. So then start writing the script for the thing that you want to direct or whatever, you know, all these things. Suddenly there was time, you know. And then the, and there were whole days spent rewatching Thirty Rock, you know, from the beginning. What does these uh, What do these different mediums do for you when you're when you're thinking about film, when you're thinking about music, and we're thinking about podcasting? Is it as simple for you as, you know, retrieve file X59? Now I'm in movie mode, or, or or not to be silly about it, but like now I'm in music creativity mode. Now I'm in podcast mode. Or is it a big blur across all of these and 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 you just sort of uh, the, the, it, you end up in the medium where you think it's supposed to end up? How do you organize that? Um, I don't organize anything because I'm completely useless. Like, honestly, even when like when I had no money, I would like beg people to be my assistant. I'd be like, I can't pay you anything. I will make you spaghetti O's. Please, will you organize my shit? <laughs> I can't keep... If I walk by the piano in our house, I sit down and I start playing. Like I'll be on my way to be writing a chapter of my book and I'll see the piano and I'll be like, oh, that just sounds so nice. And then I'll sit there for an hour and I'll do that. And then the phone will go and it'll be like, have you got the chapter done yet? And it's like, no, I, I'm, I'm very butterfly minded about all of it. I love it all. It's like having loads of kids, I think. I just, um, I go from one to the other, but I do have people in my life who try to marshal that because it's incredibly irritating to be as disorganized as I am for I everybody. Sort of going from piano to typewriter to microphone and then suddenly you looked up, you're like, oh, there's a vaccine. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly, oh, what? it showed up. Oh, okay, Fauci. <laughs> what, what surprised you about podcasting? I mean, we, we do this all day, every day. We yeah. have hundreds of shows. It's our it's our passion, our lifeblood. But I'm always like, I love I, I love native podcasters. I love folks like you've interviewed a couple of them. Like Chuck Bryant was one of your guests. Oh my God. He's the co-host of Stuff You Should Know. It's the biggest podcast ever launched. This is what he does. But I'm equally, if not sometimes, more interested in folks who co come from other mediums because I want to know what they think about this. Does it feel more creatively free? Does it feel more restrained? What is it like? Yeah, it's so, it, it's crazy because it's like, because you really do get to explore all the ideas that have informed all the other stuff that I've done in my life. But that's, you know, rather toxically only ever presented in a magazine or in a newspaper with some journalist filtering you. So here is this unfiltered version of yourself. And maybe that's a bit narcissistic, but maybe that's the element. It's like you get to examine, you get to examine who you are by also if you're interested in other people, which I think Chuck is. Chuck is one of that's just one of the best episodes of my show when he came on my show. Like it was such a thrill. He is he's just brilliant. And it was also like being on the other side. Like I've listened to podcasts and love podcasts, but it's it's like 
it's really fun to pull the curtains back and to be on the other side of that and to creating content as well, you know, to put out into the world. It's like being mad about stuff and wishing that things could be different. It's like, well, then go explore ideas about how it could be different. Go talk to people who could actually affect real change. Go do that. Go do something. It right. feels remarkably um, active podcasting. I mean, I feel more activist in my own life around doing this because I feel like I'm, I'm actually doing something. It's such a cool way to put it. It's it's interesting to have this medium that's grown and grown and grown and more and more incredible creators jumping into it like yourself. And they find they find uh, rewards out of podcasting that surprise me. We have um, we have a podcast in our network called Las Culturistas, and it's with Bo and Yang from Saturday Night Live. And I always remember him saying, you know, this was it's not why I started a podcast, but it has become my respite. Uh, it's become my really personal space every week where I get to really be whatever I want to do. Uh, and and I imagine now I'm putting words in his mouth, but I imagine for a guy like that, he's just incredibly talented in the Saturday Night Live world, um, that that's a pretty important place to be able to go and uh, every week. And so it's interesting to see you feel like this has actually become not only this, but it feels it feels active and activist is something I hadn't thought of. It is a very direct uh, and, and mainline really to listeners. I have to imagine too, somebody like you who's been on the other side of that microphone for years and years, interviewed hundreds, thousands of times. Did you come at this with, I don't know, frustration may be too edgy a way to put it, but frustrations where you're like, God, all this is my chance to finally do an interview the right way because, man, I have heard a lot of bad ones. Was there any of that? Yeah, totally. I mean, 100 percent. It was like, ugh, that sucks. I'm not I'm so not going to do that. And, and I also I know what I know. I genuinely know what isn't interesting in an interview, having been interviewed a gajillion times and seeing how so interesting watching how journalists are so often working out their personal shit with these people and projecting onto celebrities and they're enraged by them or you know in love with them or or angered by them it's it's really oh enraged and angered that I, I guess I've experienced that quite a lot but it's it's so good to go golly I I wish I could just I wish I could talk like I do like I talk to my like I did talk to my parents, like I talked to my friends, like I talked to the interesting people that I meet at dinner parties. I wish that I could interrogate that further. And here is this medium that allows you, it appears casual, but it's, it is, it's not at all. Yeah. It's sobering how wonderful it is and how serious, because just what you said, it's this, it's such a direct, it's such a direct line to the people who are listening. Um, and when you're in someone's head, it's very, very intimate, you know. If there's a distance, when I, you know, when you're looking at a picture, you've got a, you've got this, you've got a wall between you. It's actually more intimate just to listen to somebody and um, and hear what they say as opposed to to looking at their face and see that, you know, you then project something onto it. You can only hear what's, hear the words that someone is saying. So. Yeah, there are words that get thrown around in media a lot, like authentic and genuine and raw and real, and and podcasting actually feels like it's sort of kind of those words. Oh, uh, definitely. It's interesting. Yeah. I've heard this explained a few different ways. Some of it, I think, is genuinely the, the psychology that's hard to sort of grapple with, but of actually being inside someone's head through headphones. Um, some of it, I think, is also because podcasts feel like a one-to-one -one medium. It feels like that piece of content, that conversation, like you're on a phone call, it feels yes. like that, as opposed to I'm watching a video that was made for, or a film that was made for a lot of people. And back to your back to your point on interviews and the and and the real interviews, it makes me think of oh my you got love the background noise. There's quarantine right there. That's my, my Henry. Come over here one second. This is my come over here, little thundering thundercats down the stairs. I'm so sorry. This is my this is my twelve year old Henry. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm very bad at creeping around. No, you're doing, you're doing, you're doing a great job. Thank you. No. Great Have creep. a nice time. Thank you. I'm going to ask him the Bruce questionnaire in a second. We'll get him back. 
all of like 412 Proust questions. Exactly. But it made me think of like uh, Paris Hilton said something similar. She was like, man, I have done so many interviews in my life. Sat down, and I knew within seconds that the journalist wasn't genuine, wasn't authentic. They had this idea of who Paris Hilton was. And I would suffer through the interview. It was fine. But podcasting is my chance to do it right. And she's delivering these incredible conversations with people that are surprising and authentic and awesome. So hopefully the medium is that for some people. Listen, I will I will end by asking you one more of your questions. When and where were you the happiest? Oh, um, it is always is always on the beach. It is always by the sea. I grew up in in the in the Caribbean in Barbados and you know, my parents weren't married. Um, so even after they broke up, they were my very good friends. And she used to come, my mom used to come on vacation with my dad and his new wife and us. And um, there was just this great, there was just this great day when we were all together. We were all hanging by the ocean. And I think I just got back from surfing and my sister was there and her mom, my stepmom, my dad. And, and my dad went, darling. And me and my sister and my mother and my stepmother, we all went, yeah. <laughs> it was just, <laughs> I was so, I was so happy because I could see how things could transform. You know, it had been super acrimonious when they broke up and like here we were all, you know, the, the idea of transformation for me is the, the happiest, happiest thing because it means all things can change, however dreadful they might be. It can always and will always evolve into something else. It's amazing how specific that was. You have this like words worthy and spot of time on that beach in that moment. It's really kind of beautiful. So oh, really, you. really, really do appreciate it. Podversations is a production of iHeartRadio. You can find more from the biggest names in podcasting on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts.